All Lovely Things by Conrad Aiken. Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. June 2012. All lovely things will have an ending. All lovely things will fade and die. And youth that's now so bravely spending will beg a penny by and by. Fine ladies soon are all forgotten and goldenrod is dust when dead the sweetest flesh and flowers are rotten and cobwebs tent the brightest head come back true love sweet youth return but time goes on and will unheeding though hands will reach and eyes will yearn and the wild days set true hearts bleeding come back true love sweet youth remain but goldenrod and daisies wither and over them blows autumn rain they pass they pass and know not whither and a poem this recording is in the public domain Annabel Lee by Edgar Allan Poe, read for LibriVox.org by Cusper Nyssen. It was many and many a year ago, in a kingdom by the sea, that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabel Lee, with a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud, chilling my beautiful Annabel Lee, so that her high-born kinsmen came and bore her away from me to shut her up in a sepulchre in this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, that was the reason, as all men know in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of the cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabel Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we. And neither the angels in heaven above, nor the demons down under the sea, can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabel Lee. For the moon ever beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabel Lee, and the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And so all the night tight I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, in the sepulchre there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Balcony by Charles Baudelaire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. The Balcony. O oh, mother of memories, mistress of mistresses, O oh, thou all my pleasures, O oh, thou all my prayers, canst thou remember those luscious caresses, the charm of the hearth and the sweet evening airs? O oh, mother of memories, mistress of mistresses, those evenings illumined by the glow of the coal and those roseate nights with their vaporous wings how calm was thy breast and how good was thy soul twas when we uttered imperishable things those evenings illumined by the glow of the coal how lovely the suns on those hot autumn nights how vast were the heavens and the heart how hale as i leaned towards you o oh, my queen of delights the scent of thy blood i seem to inhale 
how lovely the sun on those hot autumn nights the shadows of night-time grew dense like a pall and deep through the darkness thine eyes i divined and i drank of thy breath o sweetness o gall and thy feet in my brotherly hands reclined the shadows of night-time grew dense like a pall i know how to call forth those moments so dear and to live my past laid on thy knees once more for where should i seek for thy beauties but here in thy languorous heart and thy body so pure i know how to call forth those moments so dear those perfumes those infinite kisses and sighs are they born in some gulf in our plummets denied like rejuvenate suns that mount up to the skies that first have been cleansed in the depths of the tide o oh, perfumes o oh, infinite kisses and sighs end of poem this recording is in the public domain the buried life by matthew arnold read for LibriVox.org by jared hess in mapleton utah on june fifteenth two thousand twelve this recording is in the public domain. Light flows our war of mocking words, And yet, behold with tears, mine eyes are wet. I feel a nameless sadness o'er me roll. Yes, yes, we know that we can jest, We know, we know that we can smile, But there's a something in this breast To which thy light words bring no rest and thy gay smiles no anodyne give me thy hand and hush a while and turn those limpid eyes on mine and let me read their love thy inmost soul alas is even love too weak to unlock the heart and let it speak are even lovers powerless to reveal to one another what indeed they feel I knew the mass of men concealed their thoughts, For fear that if revealed they would by other men Be met with blank indifference, or with blame reproved. I knew they lived and moved, tricked in disguises, Alien to the rest of men and alien to themselves, And yet the same heart beats in every human breast. But we, my love, doth a like spell benumb our hearts, our voices? Must we too be dumb? Ah, well for us if even we, Even for a moment, can get free our heart, And have our lips unchained, For that which seals them hath been deep ordained. Fate, which foresaw how frivolous a baby man would be, By what distractions he would be possessed, How he would pour himself in every strife, And well nigh change his own identity, that it might keep from his capricious play his genuine self and force him to obey even in his own despite his being's law bade through the deep recesses of our breast the unregarded river of our life pursue with indiscernible flow its way and that we should not see the buried stream and seem to be eddying at large in blind uncertainty though driving on with it eternally but often in the world's most crowded streets, but often in the din of strife, there rises an unspeakable desire, after the knowledge of our buried life, a thirst to spend our fire and restless force in tracking out our true original course, a longing to inquire into the mystery of this heart which beats so wild, so deep in us, to know whence our lives come and where they go and many a man in his own breast then delves but deep enough alas none ever minds and we have been on many thousand lines and we have shown on each spirit and power but hardly have we for one little hour been on our own line have we been ourselves Hardly had skill to utter one of all the nameless feelings that course through our breast. 
but they course on for ever unexpressed, and long we try in vain to speak and act our hidden self. And what we say and do is eloquent, is well, but tis not true. And then we will no more be racked with inward striving, and demand of all the thousand nothings of the hour their stupefying power. Ah, yes, and they benumb us at our call. Yet still, from time to time, vague and forlorn, from the soul's subterranean depth unborn, as from an infinitely distant land come airs and floating echoes, and convey a melancholy into all our day. Only, but this is rare, when a beloved hand is laid in ours, when jaded with the rush and glare of the interminable hours, our eyes can in another's eyes read clear. When our world-deafened ear is by the tones of a loved voice caressed, a bolt is shot back somewhere in our breast, and a lost pulse of feeling stirs again. The eye sinks inward, and the heart lies plain, and what we mean we say, and what we would we know. A man becomes aware of his life's flow, and hears its winding murmur, and he sees the meadows where it glides, the sun, the breeze. And there arrives a lull in the hot race, wherein he doth forever chase, that flying and elusive shadow rest. An air of coolness plays upon his face, and an unwanted calm pervades his breast. And then he thinks he knows the hills where his life rose, and the sea where it goes. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. By the Bivouac's Fitful Flame by Walt Whitman, read for LibriVox.org, by Matteo Palferman. This recording is in the public domain. By the bivouac's fitful flame, a procession winding around me, solemn and sweet and slow, but first I note, the tents of the sleeping army, the fields and woods dim outline, the darkness lit by spots of kindled fire, the silence like a phantom far or near, an occasional figure moving. The shrubs and trees, as I lift my eyes, they seem to be stealthily watching me. While wind in procession thoughts, O oh, tender and wondrous thoughts, of life and death, of home and past and love, and of those that are far away, a solemn and slow procession there as I lit on the ground, by the bivouac's fitful flame. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Canada by Ella Wheeler Wilcox Read for LibriVox.org by Cress England, father and mother in one, Look on your stalwart son, Sturdy and strong with the valor of youth. Where is another so lusty, Coated and mailed with the armor of truth? Where is another so trusty? Flesh of your flesh, and bone of your bone, He is yours alone. England, father and mother in one, See the wealth of your son, Forest primeval, and virginal sod, Wheat fields golden and splendid, Riches of nature and opulent God, For the use of his children intended, A courage that dares, and a hope that endures, and a soul all yours. England, father and mother in one, hear the cry of your son. Little cares he for the glories of earth. Lying around and above him, yearning is he for the rights of his birth, and the heart of his mother to love him. Vast are your gifts to him, ample his store. Now open your door. England, father and mother in one, heed the voice of your son. Proffer him place in your councils of state, 
let him sit near and attend you ponder his words in the hour of debate strong is his arm to defend you flesh of your flesh and bone of your bone give him his own end of poem this recording is in the public domain a certain young lady by washington irving Read for LibriVox.org by Paul Gonzalez in Cavite, Philippines. There's a certain young lady who's just in her hair day and full of all mischief. I mean, so teasing, so pleasing, capricious, delicious, and you know very well whom I mean. With an eye dark as night, yet the noonday more bright, was ever a black eye so keen? I can't thrill with a glance. With a beam con in trance, and you know very well whom I mean. With a stately step, such as you'd expect in a duchess, and a brow might distinguish a queen, with a mighty proud air, that says, Touch me who dare, and you know very well whom I mean. With a toss of the head, that strikes one quite dead, but a smile to revive one again, that toss so appalling, that smile so enthralling, and you know very well whom I mean. Confound her, devil take her, a cruel heartbreaker. But hold, see that smile so serene. God love her, God bless her, may nothing stress her. You know very well whom I mean. Heaven help to adore her, who happens to bore her, to love her who wakens her spleen. But to bless for sinner, is he who shall win her, and you know very well whom I mean. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Children's Hour by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Read for LibriVox.org by Amanda Hartke. Between the dark and the daylight, when the night is beginning to lower, comes a pause in the day's occupations that is known as the children's hour. I hear in the chamber above me the patter of little feet, the sound of a door that is opened, and voices soft and sweet. From my study I see in the lamplight, descending the broad hall stair, grave Alice and laughing Allegra, and Edith with golden hair. A whisper and then a silence, yet I know by their merry eyes they are plotting and planning together to take me by surprise. A sudden rush from the stairway, a sudden raid from the hall. By three doors left unguarded, they enter my castle wall. They climb up into my turret, o'er the arms and back of my chair. If I try to escape, they surround me. They seem to be everywhere. They almost devour me with kisses, their arms about me entwine till I think of the Bishop of Bingen in his mouse tower on the Rhine. Do you think, O oh blue-eyed banditti, because you have scaled the wall, such an old mustache as I am is not a match for you all? I have you fast in my fortress, and will not let you depart, but put you down in the dungeon in the round tower of my heart. And there I will keep you for ever, yes, for ever and a day, till the walls shall crumble to ruin and moulder in dust away. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Descalça vai para a fonte. By Luís Vaz de Camões, read for LibriVox.org by Carlos Gomes in Vila Franca de Xira, Portugal, June 2012. Descalça vai para a fonte, Leonor pela verdura, vai formosa e não segura. Leva na cabeça o pote, o texto nas mãos de prata, cinta de fina escarlata, sainho de chamalote, traz a vasquinha de cote, mais branca que a neve pura, vai formosa e não segura, descobre a tua cá garganta, cabelos de ouro entrançado, fita de cor de encarnado, tão linda que o mundo espanta, chove nela a graça tanta, que dá graça à formosura, vai formosa e não segura. End of poem, this recording is in the public domain. The Double Fortress by Alfred Noyce, read for LibriVox.org by Kasper Nijssen. Time wouldst thou hurt us, never shall we grow old. Break as thou wilt these bodies of blind clay, 
thou canst not touch us here in our stronghold where two made one laugh all their powers away though ramparts crumble and rusty gates grow thin and our brave fortress dwine to a hollow shell thou shalt hear heavenly laughter far within where young as love to hidden lovers dwell we shall go clambering up our twisted stairs to watch the moon through rifts in our great towers thou shalt hear whispers kisses and sweet prayers creeping through all our creviced walls like flowers wouldst wreck us time when thy dull leaguer brings the last wall down look heavenward we have wings End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Dream by Helen Hunt Jackson. Read for LibriVox.org by Paul Gonzalez in Cavite, Philippines. I dreamed that I was dead and crossed the heavens, heavens after heavens with burning feet and swift, and cried, O oh God, where art thou? I left one. On earth whose burden I would pray thee lift. I was so dead I wondered at nothing, Not even that the angels slowly turned, Their faces speechless as I hurried by, Beneath my feet the golden pavements burned. Nor at the first that I could not find God, Because the heavens stretched endlessly like space, At last that terror seized my very soul, I seemed alone in all the crowded place. Then, sudden, one compassionate cried out, Though like the rest, his face from me he turned, As I were one no angel might regard. Beneath my feet golden pavements burned. No more in heaven than earth will he find God, Who does not know his loving mercy swift, But waits the moment consummate and bright, Each burden from each human soul to lift. Though I was dead, I died again for shame, lonely, to flee from heaven again, O turn. The ranks of angels looked away from me, beneath my feet the golden pavements burn. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Hoc erat in Wotis by Horace this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carol Box Hoc erat in Wotis This used to be my wish, a bit of land, a house and garden with a spring at hand, and just a little wood. The gods have crowned my humble vows. I prosper and abound, nor ask I more, kind Mercury, save that thou wouldst give me still the goods thou givest me now. If crime has ne'er increased them, nor excess and want of thrift are like to make them less. If I ne'er pray like this, O oh, might that nook, which spoils my field, be mine by hook or crook. O oh, for a stroke of luck like his, who found a crock of silver turning up the ground. And thanks to good Alcides, farmed as by the very land where he had slaved for hire. If what I have contents me, hear my prayer. Still let me feel thy tutelary care, and let my sheep, my pastures, this and that, my all in fact, except my brains, be fat. Now, lodged in my hill castle, can I choose companion fitter than my homely muse? Here no town duties vex no plague winds blow nor autumn friend to graveyards works me woe sire of the morning do i call thee right or hearst thou janus name with more delight who introducest so the gods ordain life's various tasks inaugurate my strain at rome to bail i'm summoned do your part thou bidst me quick lest others get the start so, whether Boreas roars or winter's snow clips short the day, to court I needs must go. I give the fatal pledge, distinct and loud, 
then pushing struggling battle with the crowd now madman clamours someone not without a threat or two just mind what you're about what you must knock down all that's in your way because you're posting to my seniors, eh this pleases me i own but when i get to black as squealy eye trouble waits me yet for other people's matters in a swarm buzz round my head and take my ears by storm sir roscius would be glad if you'd arrange by eight a m to be with him on change quintus the scribes entreat you to attend a meeting of importance as their friend just get my scene a seal attached to these i'll try oh you can do it if you please seven years or rather eight have well nigh passed since with my seniors friends i first was classed to this extent that driving through the street he'd stop his car and offer me a seat or make such chance remarks as what's a clock will syria's champion beat the thracian cock these morning frosts are apt to be severe just chit-chat suited to a leaky ear since that auspicious date each day and hour has placed me more and more in envy's power he joined his play sat next him at the games a child of fortune all the world exclaims from the high rostra a report comes down and like a chilly fog pervades the town each man i meet accosts me is it so you live so near the gods you're sure to know that news about the dacians have you heard no secret tidings not a single word oh yes you love to banter us poor folk nay if i've heard a tittle may i choke will caesar grant his veterans their estates in italy or t'other side of the straits i swear that i know nothing and am dumb they think me deep miraculously mum and so my day between my fingers slips while fond regrets keep rising to my lips o oh, my dear homestead in the country when shall i behold your pleasant face again and studying now now dozing and at ease imbibe forgetfulness of all this tease o oh, when pythagoras shall thy brother been with pork and cabbage on my board be seen o oh, happy nights and suppers half divine when at the home god's altar i and mine enjoy a frugal meal and leave the treat unfinished for my merry slaves to eat not bound by madcap rules but free to choose big cups or small each follows his own views you toss your wine off boldly if you please or gently sip and mellow by degrees we talk of not our neighbour's house or field nor the last feet of lepos the light healed but matters which to know concerns us more which none but at his peril can ignore whether tis wealth or virtue makes men blest what leads to friendship worth or interest in what the good consists and what the end and chief of goods on which the rest depend while neighbour servius with his rustic wit tells old wives tales this case or that to hit should some one be unwise enough to praise aurelius toilsome wealth he straightway says one day a country mouse in his poor home received an ancient friend a mouse from rome the host though close and careful to a guest could open still so now he did his best he spares not oats or vetches in his chaps raisins he brings and nibbled bacon scraps hoping by varied dainties to entice his town-bred guest so delicate and nice who condescended graciously to touch thing after thing but never would take much while he the owner of the mansion sate on threshed out straw and spelt and darnels at at length the townsman cries i wonder how you can live here friend on this hill's rough brow take my advice and leave these ups and downs this hill and dale for humankind and towns come now go home with me remember all who live on earth are mortal great and small then take good sir your pleasure while you may with life so short twere wrong to lose a day this reasoning made the rustic's head turn round forth from his hole he issues with a bound 
and they too make together for their mark, in hopes to reach the city during dark. The midnight sky was bending over all, when they set foot within a stately hall, where couches of wrought ivory had been spread with gorgeous coverlets of Tyrian red, and viands piled up high in baskets lay, the relics of a feast of yesterday. The townsman does the honours, lays his guest at ease upon a couch with crimson dressed, then nimbly moves in character of host, and offers in succession boiled and roast, nay, like a well-trained slave, each wish prevents, and tastes before the titbits he presents. The guest, rejoicing in his altered fare, assumes in turn a genial diner's air, when hark, a sudden banging of the door, each from his couch is tumbled on the floor. Half dead, they scurry round the room, poor things, while the whole house with barking mastiffs rings. Then says the rustic, It may do for you this life, but I don't like it, so adieu. Give me my hole, secure from all alarms, I'll prove that tears and vetches still have charms. End of Satire 6 The Lady of Shalott by Lord Alfred Tennyson Read for LibriVox.org by Victoria Martin Part 1 On either side the river lie long fields of barley and of rye that clothe the wold and meet the sky and through the field the road runs by to many towered Camelot and up and down the people go gazing where the lilies blow round an island there below the island of shalott willows whiten aspens quiver little breezes dusk and shiver through the wave that runs forever by the island in the river flowing down to camelot four gray walls and four gray towers overlook a space of flowers and the silent isle embowers the lady of shalott by the margin willow veiled slide the heavy barges trailed by slow horses and unhailed the shallop flitteth silken sailed skimming down to camelot but who hath seen her wave her hand or at the casement seen her stand or is she known in all the land the lady of shalott only reapers reaping early in among the bearded barley hear a song that echoes cheerly from the river winding clearly down to towered camelot and by the moon the reaper weary piling sheaves in uplands airy listening whispers tis the fairy lady of shalott part two there she weaves by night and day a magic web with colors gay she has heard a whisper say a curse is on her if she stay to look down to camelot she knows not what the curse may be and so she weaveth steadily and little other care hath she the lady of shalott and moving through a mirror clear that hangs before her all the year shadows of the world appear there she sees the highway near winding down to camelot there the river eddy whirls and there the surly village churls and the red cloaks of market girls pass onward from shalott sometimes a troop of damsels clad in abbot on an ambling pad sometimes a curly shepherd lad or long-haired page in crimson clad goes by to towered camelot and sometimes through the mirror blue the knights come riding two and two she hath no loyal knight and true the lady of shalott but in her web she still delights to weave the mirror's magic sights for often through the silent nights a funeral 
with plumes and lights and music went to camelot or when the moon was overhead came two young lovers lately wed i am half sick of shadows said the lady of shalott part three a bow-shot from her bower eaves he rode between the barley sheaves the sun came dazzling through the leaves and flamed upon the brazen greaves of bold sir lancelot a red cross knight for ever kneeled to a lady in his shield that sparkled on the yellow field beside remote shalott the gemmy bridle glittered free like to some branch of stars we see hung in the golden galaxy the bridal bells rang merrily as he rode down to camelot and from his blazoned baldric slung a mighty silver bugle hung and as he rode his armor rung beside remote shalott all in the blue unclouded weather thick jeweled shone saddle leather the helmet and the helmet feather burned like one burning flame together as he rode down to camelot as often through the purple night below the starry clusters bright some bearded meteor trailing light moves over still shalott his broad clear brow in sunlight glowed on burnished hooves his warhorse trod from underneath his helmet flowed his coal-black curls as on he rode as he rode down to camelot from the bank and from the river he flashed into the crystal mirror tura lura by the river sang sir lancelot she left the web she left the loom she made three paces through the room she saw the water lily bloom she saw the helmet and the plume she looked down to camelot out flew the web and floated wide the mirror cracked from side to side the curse is come upon me cried the lady of shalott part four in the stormy east wind straining the pale yellow woods were waning the broad stream in his banks complaining heavily the low sky raining over towered camelot down she came and found a boat beneath a willow left afloat and round about the prow she wrote the lady of shalott and down the river's dim expanse like some bold sayer in a trance seeing all his own mischance with a glassy countenance did she look to Camelot, and at the closing of the day she loosed the chain and down she lay. The broad stream bore her far away, the Lady of Shalott, lying robed in snowy white that loosely flew to left and right, the leaves upon her falling light. Through the noises of the night she floated down to Camelot. And as the boat had wound along the willowy hills and fields among, they heard her singing her last song, the Lady of Shalott. Heard a carol, mournful, holy, chanted loudly, chanted lowly, till her blood was frozen slowly, and her eyes were darkened wholly, turned to towered Camelot. For ere she reached upon the tide the first house by the water side, singing in her song she died, the Lady of Shalott. Under tower and balcony, by garden wall and gallery, a gleaming shape she floated by, dead pale between the houses high, silent into Camelot. Out upon the wharfs they came, knight and burgher, lord and dame, and round the prow they read her name, the Lady of Shalott. Who is this, and what is here? And in the lighted palace near died the sound of royal cheer, 
and they cross themselves for fear all the knights at camelot but lancelot mused a little space he said she has a lovely face god in his mercy lend her grace the lady of shalott end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Lanorn She by Francis Ledwidge Read for LibriVox.org by Noel Badrian, County Offaly, Ireland Powdered and perfumed, the full bee winged heavily across the clover, And where the hills were dim with dew, purple and blue, the west leaned over. A willow spray dipped in the stream, moving a gleam of silver ringing and by a finny creek a maid filled all the shade with softest singing listening my heart and soul at strife on the edge of life i seemed to hover for i knew my love had come at last that my joy was past and my gladness over i tiptoed gently up and stooped above her looped and shining tresses and asked her of her kin and name and why she came from fairy places she told me of a sunny coast beyond the most adventurous sailor where she had spent a thousand years out of the fears that now assail her and there she told me honey drops out of the tops of ash and willow and in the mellow shadow sleep doth sweetly keep her poppy pillow nor autumn with her brown line marks the time of larks the length of roses but song time there is over never nor flower time ever ever closes and wildly through uncurling ferns fast water turns down valleys singing filling with scented winds the dales setting the bells of sleep a ringing and when the thin moon lowly sinks through cloudy chinks a silver glory lingers upon the left of night till dawn delights the meadows hoary and by the lakes the skies are white oh the delight when swans are coming among the flowers sweet joy bells peal and quick bees wheel in drowsy humming the squirrel leaves her dusty house and in the boughs makes fearless gambol and falling down in fire drops red the fruit is shed from every bramble then gathered all about the trees glad galaxies of youth are dancing treading the perfume of the flowers filling the hours with mazy glancing and when the dance is done the trees are left to peace and the brown woodpecker and on the western slopes of sky the day's blue eye begins to flicker but at the sighing of the leaves when all earth grieves for lights departed an ancient and a sad desire steals in to tire the human-hearted no fairy aid can save them now nor turn their prow upon the ocean the hundred years that missed each heart above them start their wheels in motion and so our loves are lost she sighed and far and wide we seek new treasure for who on time or timeless hills can live the ills of loveless leisure fairer than usna's youngest son o oh, my poor one what flower-bed holds you or wrecked upon the shores of home what wave of foam with white enfolds you you rode with kings on hills of green and lovely queens have served you banquet sweet wine from berries bruised they brought and shyly sought the lips which drank it but in your dim grave of the sea there shall not be a friend to love you and ever heedless of your loss the earth ships cross the storms above you and still the chase goes on and still the wine shall spill and vacant places be given over to the new as love untrue keeps changing faces 
and i must wander with my song far from the young till love returning brings me the beautiful reward of some heart stirred by my long yearning friend have you heard a bird lament when sleet is sent for april weather as beautiful she told her grief as down through leaf and flower i led her and friend could i remain unstirred without a word for such a sorrow say can the lark forget the cloud when poppies shroud the seeded furrow like a poor widow whose late grief seeks for relief in lonely byways the moon companionless and dim took her dull rim through starless highways i was too weak with dreams to feel enchantment steal with guilt upon me she slipped a flower upon the wind and laughed to find how she had won me from hill to hill from land to land her lovely hand is beckoning for me i follow on through dangerous zones cross dead men's bones and oceans stormy some day i know she'll wait at last and lock me fast in white embraces and down mysterious ways of love we two shall move to fairy places End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. O Captain, My Captain by Walt Whitman Read for LibriVox.org by Jared Hess in Mapleton, Utah on June fifteenth, two 2012 This recording is in the public domain. O Captain, My Captain, Our fearful trip is done. The ship has weathered every rack, the prize we sought is won. The port is near, the bells I hear, the people all exulting, while follow eyes the steady keel, the vessel grim and daring. But, O oh, heart, 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 O oh, the bleeding drops of red, where on the deck my captain lies, fallen cold and dead. O oh, captain, my captain, Rise up and hear the bells, rise up, for you the flag is flung, for you the bugle trills, for you bouquets and ribboned wreaths, for you the shores a-crowding, for you they call the swaying mass, their eager faces turning. Here, Captain, dear father, the arm beneath your head, it is some dream that on the deck you've fallen cold and dead. My captain does not answer, his lips are pale and still. My father does not feel my arm, he has no pulse nor will. The ship is anchored safe and sound, its voyage closed and done. From fearful trip the victor ship comes in with object won. Exult, O shores, and ring, O bells, but I with mournful tread walk the deck my captain lies fallen cold and dead end of poem this recording is in the public domain o moon large golden summer moon by matilda blind read for LibriVox.org by verity kendall o moon large golden summer moon hanging between the linden trees which in the intermittent breeze beat with the rhythmic pulse of june o night air scented through and through with honey-coloured flower of lime sweet now as in that other time when all my heart was sweet as you the sorcery of this breathing bloom works like enchantment in my brain till shuddering back to life again my dead self rises from its tomb and lovely with the love of your its white ghost haunts the moon-white ways, but when it meets me face to face, flies trembling to the grave once more. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On Growing Old by John Maysfield Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio June 2012 be with me beauty for the fire is dying my dog and i are old too old for roving 
man whose young passion sets the spindrift flying is soon too lame to march too cold for loving i take the book and gather to the fire turning old yellow leaves minute by minute the clock ticks to my heart a withered wire moves a thin ghost of music in the spinet i cannot sail your seas i cannot wander your cornland nor your hill land nor your valleys ever again nor share the battle yonder where the young knight the broken squadron rallies only stay quiet while my mind remembers the beauty of fire from the beauty of embers beauty have pity for the strong have power the rich their wealth the beautiful their grace summer of man its sunlight and its flower springtime of man all april in a face only as in the jostling in the strand where the mob thrusts or loiters or is loud the beggar with the saucer in his hand ask only a penny from the passing crowd so from this glittering world with all its fashion its fire and play of men its stir its march let me have wisdom beauty wisdom and passion bread to the soul rain when the summers parch give me but these and though the darkness close even the night will blossom as the rose and a poem this recording is in the public domain only in sleep by sarah teasdale read for LibriVox.org by Dana Moylinger. Only in sleep I see their faces, Children I played with when I was a child. Louise comes back with her brown hair braided, Annie with ringlets warm and wild. Only in sleep time is forgotten, What may have come to them, who can know? Yet we played last night as long ago, And the dollhouse stood at the turn of the stair. The years had not sharpened their smooth round faces. I met their eyes and found them mild. Do they too dream of me, I wonder? And for them am I too a child? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Oven Bird by Robert Frost. Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. There is a singer, everyone has heard, loud, a midsummer and a midwood bird, who makes the solid tree trunk sound again. He says that leaves are old and that for flowers midsummer is to spring as one to ten. He says the early petal fall is past when pear and cherry bloom went down in showers on sunny days, a moment overcast. And comes that other fall, we name the fall. He says the highway dust is over all. The bird would cease and be as other birds, but that he knows in singing not to sing. The question that he frames in all but words is what to make of a diminished thing. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Patterns by Amy Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Capricia Page I walk down the garden paths, And all the daffodils are blowing, And the bright blue squills. I walk down the patterned garden paths In my stiff, brocaded gown with my powdered hair and jeweled fan i too am a rare pattern as i wander down the garden paths my dress is richly figured and the train 
makes a pink and silver stain on the gravel and the thrift of the borders. Just a plate of current fashion, tripping by in high-heeled, ribboned shoes. Not a softness anywhere about me, only whalebone and brocade. And I sink on a seat in the shade of a lime tree, for my passion wars against the stiff brocade. The daffodils and squills flutter in the breeze as they please, and I weep, for the lime tree is in blossom, and one small flower has dropped upon my bosom. And the plashing of the water drops in the marble fountain comes down the garden paths. The dripping never stops. Underneath my stiffened gown is the softness of a woman bathing in a marble basin. A basin in the midst of hedges grown so thick she cannot see her lover hiding, but she guesses he is near, and the sliding of the water seems the stroking of a dear hand upon her. What is summer in a fine brocaded gown? I should like to see it lying in a heap upon the ground, all the pink and silver crumpled up on the ground. I would be the pink and silver as I ran along the paths, and he would stumble after, bewildered by my laughter, and I would see the sun flashing from his sword-hilt and the buckles on his shoes. I would choose to lead him in a maze along the patterned paths, a bright and laughing maze for my heavy-booted lover till he caught me in the shade, and the buttons of his waistcoat bruised my body as he clasped me, aching, melting, unafraid, with the shadows of the leaves and the sun-drops, and the plopping of the water-drops all about us in the open afternoon. I am very like to swoon with the weight of this brocade, for the sun sifts through the shade. Underneath the fallen blossom in my bosom is a letter I have hid. It was brought to me this morning by a rider from the Duke. Madam, we regret to inform you that Lord Hartwell died in action Thursday sen night. As I read it in the white morning sunlight, the letters squirmed like snakes. Any answer, madam? said my footman. No, I told him. See that the messenger takes some refreshment. No, no answer. And I walked into the garden, up and down the patterned paths in my stiff, correct brocade. The blue and yellow flowers stood up proudly in the sun, each one. I stood upright, too, held rigid to the pattern by the stiffness of my gown. Up and down I walked, up and down. In a month he would have been my husband. In a month here, underneath this lime, we would have broke the pattern. He for me, and I for him. He as colonel, I as lady. On this shady seat. He had a whim that sunlight carried blessing, and I answered, It shall be as you have said. Now he is dead. In summer and in winter I shall walk up and down the patterned garden paths in my stiff, brocaded gown. The squills and daffodils will give place to pillared roses, and to asters, and to snow. I shall go up and down in my gown, gorgeously arrayed, boned and stayed, and the softness of my body 
will be guarded from embrace by each button, hook, and lace. For the man who should loose me is dead, fighting with the duke in Flanders, in a pattern called a war. Christ, what are patterns for? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Perdigão perdeu a pena. By Luís Vasco Camões, read for LibriVox.org, by Carlos Gomes, em Vila Franca de Xira, Portugal, de junho de 2012. Perdigão perdeu a pena, não há mal que não lhe venha. Perdigão, que o pensamento subiu a um alto lugar, perde a pena do voar, ganha a pena do tormento. Não tem no ar nem no vento asas com que sustenha, não há mal que não lhe venha. Quis voar uma alta torre, mas achou-se desazado, e vendo-se depenado, de puro penado morre. Se a queixume se socorre, lança no fogo mais lenha. Não há mal que não lhe venha. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Petition by Ella Wheeler Wilcox Read for LibriVox.org by Chris God, may thy loving spirit work In heart of Russian and of Turk until throughout each clime and land armenian and jew may stand and claim the right of every soul to seek by its own path the goal parts of the universal force rills from the same eternal source back to that source all races go god help thy world to see it so end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe Read for LibriVox.org by Verity Kendall Once, upon a midnight dreary, While I pondered, weak and weary, Over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, While I nodded, nearly napping, Suddenly there came a tapping, As if someone gently rapping, Rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, Tapping at my chamber door, Only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow. Vainly I had sought to borrow from my books a cease of sorrow. Sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore, nameless here for evermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into the darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the darkness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more back into the chamber turning all my soul within me burning soon again i heard a tapping somewhat louder than before surely said i surely that is something at my window lattice let me see then what thereat is and this mystery explore let my heart be still a moment and this mystery explore tis the wind and nothing more open here i flung the shutter when with many a flirt and flutter in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mine of lord or lady perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be short and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore, Tell me what thy lordly name is, 
on the night's plutonian shore quoth the raven nevermore much i marvelled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly though its answer little meaning little relevancy bore for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door such a name as nevermore but the raven sitting lonely on this placid bust spoke only that one word as if his soul in that one word he did outpour nothing further than he uttered not a feather than he fluttered till i scarcely more than muttered other friends have flown before on the morrow he will leave me as my hopes have flown before then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, Doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store, Caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster Followed fast and followed faster, till his songs one burden bore, Till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore, Of never, nevermore. But the raven, still beguiling all my sad soul into smiling, Straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then, upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore, meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing, to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining, on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press, ah, never more. Then, methought, the air grew denser, perfumed from some unseen censer, swung by seraphim, whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite, and nepenthe thee, for thy memories of Lenore, Quaff, oh, quaff this kind nepenthe, and forget this loss of nor, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether the tempter sent, or whether the tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell the soul with sorrow laden, if, within the distant Hayden, it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels named Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked up, starting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart, and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting, on the pallid bust of the palace just above my chamber door and his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore end of poem this recording is in the public domain the road not taken by robert frost Read for LibriVox.org by Victoria Martin Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, And sorry I could not travel both, And be one traveller. Long I stood, And looked down one as far as I could, To where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, as just as fair, And having perhaps the better claim, Because it was grassy and wanted wear, Though... As for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I... I took the one less travelled by, and that has made all the difference. End of poem. 
This recording is in the public domain. Roses and Rue. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Roses and Rue by Oscar Wilde. Could we dig up this long buried treasure? Were it worth the pleasure, we never could learn love's song. We are parted too long. Could the passionate past that is fled call back its dead? Could we live it all over again? Were it worth the pain? I remember we used to meet by an ivied seat, and you warbled each pretty word with the air of a bird, and your voice had a quaver in it, just like a linnet, and shook as the blackbird's throat with its last big note, and your eyes, they were green and gray like an April day, but lit into amethyst when I stooped and kissed, and your mouth, it would never smile for a long, long while, then it rippled all over with laughter five minutes after. You were always afraid of a shower, just like a flower. I remember you started and ran when the rain began. I remember I never could catch you, for no one could match you. You had wonderful, luminous, fleet little wings to your feet. I remember your hair. Did I tie it? For it always ran riot, like a tangled sunbeam of gold. These things are old. I remember so well the room and the lilac bloom that beat at the dripping pane in the warm June rain, and the color of your gown. It was amber-brown, and two yellow satin bows from your shoulders rose, and the handkerchief of French lace which you held to your face. Had a small tear left a stain? Or was it the rain? On your hand, as it waved at you, there were veins of blue, and your voice, as it said good-bye, was a petulant cry. You have only wasted your life. Ah, that was the knife. When I rushed through the garden gate, it was all too late. Could we live it over again? Were it worth the pain? Could the passionate past that has fled call back its dead? Well, if my heart must break, dear love, for your sake, it will break in music, I know. Poets' hearts break so. But strange that I was not told that the brain can hold in a tiny ivory cell God's heaven and hell. End of poem. A Sea Spell for a Picture by Dante Gabriel Rossetti Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Her lute hangs shadowed in the apple tree, while flashing fingers weave the sweet strung spell between its chords, and as the wild notes swell, the sea bird for those branches leaves the sea. But to what sound her listening ear stoops she? What netherworld gulf whispers doth she hear in answering echoes from what planisphere along the wind, along the estuary? She sinks into her spell, and when full soon her lips move, and she soars into her song, what creatures of the midmost main shall throng in furrowed surf clouds to the summoning rune, till he, the fated mariner, hears her cry, and up her rock bare breasted comes to die? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Soliloquy by Francis Ledridge. Read for LibriVox.org by Noel Badrian, County Offaly, Ireland. When I was young, I had a care, lest I should cheat me of my share of that which makes it sweet to strive for life and dying still survive a name in sunshine written higher than lark or poet dare aspire but i grew weary doing well besides twas sweeter in that hell 
down with the loud banditti people who robbed the orchards climbed the steeple for jackdaw's eyes and made the cock crow ere twas daylight on the clock i was so very bad the neighbours spoke of me at their daily labours and now i'm drinking wine in france the helpless child of circumstance to-morrow will be loud with war how will i be accounted for it is too late now to retrieve a fallen dream too late to grieve a name unmade but not too late to thank the gods for what is great a keen-edged sword a soldier's heart is greater than a poet's art and greater than a poet's fame a little grave that has no name end of poem this recording is in the public domain Tact by Ralph Waldo Emerson, sung for LibriVox.org by Iswa in Belgium in April 2012. What boots it thy virtue, what profit thy part, while one thing thou lackest, the art of all art? the only credentials passport to success opens castle and parlor address men address the maiden in danger was saved by the swain his stout arm restored her to broadway again the maid would reward him gay company come they laugh she laughs with them his moon struck and dumb this clenches the bargain sails out of the bay gets the vote in the senate spite of webster and clay has for genius no mercy for speech is no heat it lurks in the eye beam it leaps to its deed church tavern and market bed and board it will sway it has no tomorrow it ends with today End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Travels by the Fireside by Henry Wordsworth Longfellow Sung for LibriVox.org by Iswa in May 2012 The ceaseless rain is falling fast And yonder gilded vein Immovable for three days past Points to the misty main It drives me in upon myself And to the fireside gleams To pleasant books that crowd my shelf And still more pleasant dreams I read whatever bards have sung of lands beyond the sea and the bright days when i was young come thronging back to me in fancy i can hear again the alpine torrents roar the mule bells on the hills of spain the sea at elsinore i see the convent's gleaming wall rise from its groves of pine and towers of old cathedrals tall and castles by the rhine i journey on by park and spire beneath antinial trees through fields with poppies all on fire and gleams of distant seas i fear no more the dust and 
and heat no more i fear fatigue while journeying with another's feet o'er many a lengthening league let others traverse sea and land and toil through various climes i turn the world round with my hand reading these poets rhymes from them i learn whatever lies beneath this changing zone and see when looking with their eyes better than we End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. What Lips My Lips Have Kissed and Where and Why by Edna St. Vincent Millay Read for LibriVox.org by Capricia Page What lips my lips have kissed and where and why I have forgotten. And what arms have lain under my head till morning? But the rain is full of ghosts to-night That tap and sigh upon the glass And listen for reply. And in my heart there stirs a quiet pain For unremembered lads that, not again, Will turn to me at midnight with a cry. Thus in winter stands the lonely tree nor knows what birds have vanished one by one, yet knows its boughs more silent than before. I cannot say what loves have come and gone. I only know that summer sang in me a little while, that sings in me no more. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.